Welcome back to part two of our in-depth look at UEFA Financial Fair Play. So UEFA clearly stated that they want clubs to operate on the basis of their own revenue when they announced the new FFP regulations. Does that mean UEFA wanted to banish the sugar daddy from European football? What does that mean? Roman Abramovich was the perfect example of a footballing sugar daddy. The Russian bought Chelsea and poured his own money into the club. Spending for fun, Abramovich lost millions as he brought lucrative signings into the club and decided to pay their massive wage packets. Chelsea didn't start selling loads of shirts or tickets to cover the costs of all these signings. They didn't increase their revenue much, but Abramovich had very, very deep pockets and he was more than happy to cover the running costs of the club. This owner's money, however, was obviously not made in sales or earnings by the club and cannot be considered as revenue. So under new FFP regulations, it wouldn't be legal. From the point of FFP onwards, UEFA insisted that clubs could only spend the money that they actually made. Let's discuss why UEFA put this regulation in FFP, if it worked and if they ever really wanted it to work in the first place. What is the rationale behind this? Why would UEFA seek to prohibit wealthy owners from eradicating club debt with a financial gift? If an owner wants to pour money into a club to support the balance books, why isn't that okay? In any normal business, an owner can invest as much as they want. If it works out and they spend more than they make, then that's their prerogative, right? UEFA says no. You might even argue that by doing so, an owner is engaging in the very spirit that Michel Platini described. He talked about saving clubs, the real heritage of European football, for the fans and the football lovers. Was Abramovich really hurting anybody with his investment in Chelsea? I think the club enjoyed that period. As we mentioned in the last video, big spending by a club can lead to serious financial issues further down the line. For this reason, perhaps there should be some regulation on club and owner spending. Rangers and Leeds felt the pain of unsustainable spending. But perhaps for an oligarch or even a head of state, if there are billions in the bank, what harm is spending a few million going to do? Can't the owner sign up to cover the losses before he joins the club to ensure the security of the footballing institution? Or is it really necessary that a club can only operate on the strict basis of its own revenue without the financial gifts of a wealthy owner? What do you think? FFP received fierce criticism that this model would only establish an impenetrable status quo. A status quo of big clubs that will actually minimize competition in European football. Why would financial fair play be unfair? Well, if a successful and well-established club will generate more revenue, then a club like that will be able to buy better players and history would tell us that therefore it will be more successful on the pitch. If it has success on the pitch, it will get more money. TV money, shirt sales, more tickets sold, and bigger sponsorship deals. In doing so, it will keep accumulating more income. Would this not suggest that the biggest clubs, therefore, will stay the biggest clubs? You see, before Abramovich arrived on the scene at Chelsea, they weren't competing for domestic or European titles. But since then, the club has been another big player in the game. If Abramovich had never arrived and spent his own money on the club like he did, then how would another footballing giant have emerged? They probably wouldn't have. Prior to FFP, wealthy owners like Abramovich were able to take over and transform lesser clubs, forcing fierce competition upon the traditionally elite teams in England. That has now become impossible. Other business industries are not burdened with restrictions on capital injection. Why should football be any different? Restricting competition is illegal under EU law. Belgian lawyer Jean-Louis Dupont said of the UEFA break-even requirement, any sanction that aims at enforcing an illegal rule is automatically illegal. When you scratch the surface, the rule is no more than a prohibition to invest. Chelsea were bought by Abramovich in the early 2000s and Manchester City were taken over by Emirati-owned City Sports Group. Since the Blues won their first Premier League title of the Abramovich era, Chelsea and Man City have won 11 out of the 18 Premier League titles since. However, 23 of the previous 30 league titles were won by Liverpool, Arsenal and Manchester United alone. This power shift from the footballing aristocracy to the young upstarts is a byproduct of new ownership pumping money into lesser clubs and transforming them into competitors. 
If Chelsea and City hadn't received that investment, would the Premier League be better off or would the other three clubs have won 40 out of the last 48 titles? According to Deloitte, upstarts like Chelsea and City are brilliant for the football economy. They calculated that the Premier League benefited from an additional injection of £2 billion from wealthy club owners between 2006 and 2013. This money is spent by the big clubs, but naturally trickles down the leagues and across Europe, usually in the form of transfer fees. This didn't just happen in England either. New Qatari owners pumped money into PSG in France. PSG too have seen significant success since their takeover in the form of domestic domination and signing some of the planet's best players to compete in the UEFA Champions League. Football's 2000s wave of super rich investors were dubbed sugar daddy owners. In Abramovich's case, he had enough money to make a 630 million pound loss in his first eight years as Chelsea owner and to very little detriment. The sugar daddy trend has seen astronomical rises in footballers' wages and transfer fees, with more clubs competing for top players. If FFP drives these numbers back down again, then the idea is that smaller clubs will be able to compete with the big spenders, whilst avoiding risk in overspending and still breaking even. However, we have to analyse if the opposite is what will actually happen. If small clubs cannot be helped by investment, they can't really compete or grow. And if these clubs can't grow, then the rich clubs stay rich and the same teams keep winning. Which begs another question. Is this what UEFA secretly intended in the first place? To keep the rich rich and the lesser clubs at bay? Surely not. Hopefully not. Remember all those billions we mentioned the European football industry is worth? Yeah, well, everyone wants a big piece of the pie now. And that's why certain clubs have flirted with the idea of a European Super League. This way, they could avoid UEFA and make more money for themselves. With that in mind, it would suit UEFA to put those clubs at ease, wouldn't it? Maybe what they could do is ensure that those clubs will stay happy. How will they stay happy? Maybe ensure them that they will stay rich and they will stay powerful within the current system. That way, UEFA will continue to make money and the clubs won't have reason to leave. Maybe UEFA would even turn a blind eye to loopholes in the law that might suit the clubs that are already wealthy. Funnily enough, allegations have arisen. German tabloid Der Spiegel leaked that Manchester City have been using an array of means to manipulate their balance sheet, like disguising capital injection from their owner in the form of a lucrative sponsorship arrangement and paying directors using a separate company. Recent developments have seen Manchester City sanctioned again for over 100 alleged breaches of FFP rules, but they are appealing the ruling and it will be a long and drawn out process. Meanwhile, rival fans are joking that City will be stripped of titles and kicked out of the Premier League for financial doping. Look at Chelsea's recent tactics, signing players on long-term contracts in order to spread their costs over the years on the balance sheet. They haven't been punished as they found a legal loophole in FFP and they exploited it. But this goes to show how flawed FFP might be. That it may not affect the super rich and that they don't have to follow the rules. Since Chelsea's recent antics, UEFA have since announced a cap on contract lengths will soon come into play. PSG, Bayern Munich and Wolfsburg are a few more examples of other European clubs where the owners are linked to the sponsors. It has been suggested that this has allowed those clubs to manipulate similar revenue streams. All of these allegations call into question the foundation of FFP, who it serves and whether UEFA had any intention of making FFP a universal force for good. The types of deals that are said to be in place for the likes of PSG simply could not be disguised by a mid-table European team. Does this suggest that UEFA and their integrity never actually existed in the first place? If all the big clubs are still finding ways to do lucrative business in legal loopholes, then maybe FFP doesn't work after all. Maybe it wasn't meant to, and UEFA are happy that their rich friends can stay spending money and stay on top of the football pyramid. What do you think? At first, FFP seems like a sensible idea, practical and functional. But as we peel the layers off of this story, the cracks start to appear beneath the surface. In the next video, we will take a deeper and more detailed look at the UEFA integrity that allegedly motivated the new financial fair play laws. We will delve into the real reasons that may have prompted such a radical change to the laws of European football. 
and we will analyse how they will affect European clubs and football on the whole.